Would you turn with me in your Bible to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, starting with that 17th verse? And so Ephesians is one of those letters that Paul wrote from prison. And it's, it's really cool to, to see um, how ironic it is that someone from prison is writing to people who are seemingly free, but he's the one who's, who's talking freedom and the ones he's talking to need help. And so he's, they may look physically free, but they're spiritually in bondage. And they, they've put themselves in, into bondage. And, and in this letter here, he's not talking to, to um, everybody, but he's talking to Jesus followers. He's talking to the church. And when the, the, the fourth chapter of Ephesians starts out, he's talking about unity in the church. Unity, how, what, it, what the church should look like. He's, putting, he's laying out the standard, the framework of, of unity in the church, unity in the body of Christ. And then we get to verses 17 through 24, which we're gonna be going over today. And he talks about what the Christian life looks like. He's talking about what the Christian walk is supposed to look like. And then next week, we're gonna be getting into to where the Christian walk, how it looks like in your relationships, what it looks like and how, how it plays out in life in your relationships. We're gonna be talking about that next week. Uh, but this week, we're gonna be um, talking um, or reading out of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse, and it says there, so this I say and solemnly affirm together with the Lord as in his presence, that you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility or the emptiness of their minds and in the foolishness and emptiness of their souls. For their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is clouded. They are alienated and self-banished from the life of God with no shame or no share in it. This is because of the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is deep-seated within them because of the hardness and insensitivity of their heart. You may be thinking about someone else right now. Zero in and focus in. God is talking to you this morning. God is talking to me. You may think the, the pastor has all of his things together and all his ducks in a row. No, God was wrecking me all week on this passage. And so he's talking to you. He's talking to us who are in this room or who are listening online. He says, he says, and they, in that 19th verse, they, the ungodly in their spiritual apathy, having become callous and unfeeling, have given themselves over as prey to unbridled sensuality eagerly craving the practice of every kind of impurity that their desires may demand. But he, I can just, he's writing a letter, but I can just look, I can just see in my mind as he's writing the letter, as he's looking up, like he's looking at the church face to face, eye to eye. He says, church, but this is the way that you learned Christ. You did not learn Christ in this way. He says, if in fact you have really heard him and you've been taught by him, just as truth is in Jesus revealed in his life and personified in him, he was the, the personification of, of truth, that regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self. Someone say, put off your old self. Completely discard your former nature. That means flush it down the toilet because if you throw it away, you can still go back and grab it. You gotta flush that thing down the toilet. It's gotta go out the sewer so that you can't be grabbing it again. He says, completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new self. Someone say, put on the new self. The regenerated and renewed nature created in God's image, God-like in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God 
your gratitude for your salvation. Can I hear an amen? If you're in love with the word of God today, would you just put your hands together and give God thanks for his word? We thank you, Lord. So today, the title of the message today is The Old Man Has Gotta Go. Someone say, look at your neighbor and say, The Old Man Has Gotta Go. Now, after I had come up with the title, I, did, I thought about it and I was thinking, now, I hope they don't mistake this for like an old man having to go out and relieve himself out in the woods. The old man has got to go. That's not what we're talking about today. And also, also on that note, we're also not talking about wives. This isn't talking about you kicking your, your husband to the curb or your man to the curb. This is not what we're talking about. The old man has got to go. We're talking about the old nature. We're talking about the old way of thinking. We're talking about the way we used to do things that was leading us and digging us in a hole that we couldn't get out of. But now that we are Jesus followers, we've got to put off the old man. We've got to let that old man go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. In fact, would you repeat this after me? Say, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, to give me wisdom, to understand your truth, not only to hear your word, but to be a doer of your word. Help me to apply what you're telling me today to my life, changing me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Yeah, the Lord is good. So when I was growing up, I always talk about the, the years when I was chubby and curly headed. We're going to go back before that. Believe it or not, before I was chur uh, curly and churly and cubby headed, before those days, I was thin and had straight hair. Right, mom? Yeah. Yes. I have confirmation here. It wasn't until I got my tonsils out that I, I, don't, I guess I, it was hindering me from eating. So I was this thin, I don't know why, what it did to my hair, it made my hair go kinky. But um, when I was in those years, like this, when I was like six or seven years old, my mom put me in Little League. She put me in T-ball. And now that I have a five and a seven-year-old, I know how frustrating it could be to teach a human um, new tricks, new things. Putting a tool in their hand, you know, you've done it for years, so you're just, you, you, you know how to grab the bat. You know how to swing. You know how to catch a ball or throw the ball. But for them, they have no idea what's going on. So I know I, I can understand how frustrating it could be. And so looking back at, at those years, I was just starting out in T-ball. I was on the Braves. I think our, our, uh, I think our colors, I think our colors were orange. And so I can see the pictures. I think my mom still has pictures. But starting out in T-ball, um, figuring, figuring out and being, having to be taught hands-on. Like the coach would have to come behind the kids and no, like put your, like automatically the kids always want to put their hands the wrong way. No, no kiddo, like put your hand on top, you know, and, and then you got to step forward and you got to swing. And so you're learning all these fundamentals that you've never heard before. And by the end of the T-ball year, do you think, you think I was, I was pretty good? No, you could say no, it won't offend me. Cause no, I was horrible. I was in T-ball. And so, that was, so then evidently I liked it. So my mom put me into the next level, which was farm. We called it farm down in Southern California in, in Fountain Valley. And that was a coach pitch where the coach would pitch it because we weren't too good at throwing yet. If you give a kid a ball, they'll throw the ball and hit you in the head. I don't know how they do it, but they'll find your head with that ball. Um, so we have coach pitch. And by this time, things are familiar. We're not running to third base after we hit the ball now. We're running to first. Um, we know when to stop, kind of learning those kind of things, the fundamentals. We're, we're learning how to catch. We're not, qu we're not quite there yet. And then we go to the next level. Um, next level for us, I believe it was minor B and then minor A. And then after that, we go to, to the majors. And those, that, those, that's when it was starting to get competitive. We knew we were, we were now thinking two steps ahead. And for me, my coach, he put me in, in, in a baseball camp. I don't know if it was once or twice, a couple times, but where professionals come on out and they teach you the fundamentals of baseball, the things that they've learned. And so, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. And um, 
you know, learning. Now I can catch the ball. We can do trick catches and you catch it behind your back and, you know, hitting the ball, hitting home runs. Um, but then you move up to the next level um, into, I believe when, when we moved here to West Sacramento, it was called senior, the senior league. This is not senior citizen league, but the seniors. Um, and then after that, my freshman year of high school, trying out for the JV baseball team. And I, and I made the JV baseball team. And so my freshman and sophomore year, I played JV. And then my, my sophomore or my, my junior and senior year, I played varsity baseball. And my, my senior year, I can remember being, being uh, given the position of starting third baseman for the River City Raider baseball team, the high school team. And so that was a big accomplishment to where um, I had I'd come so far and to, to, with something that I really loved and something that I really enjoyed and um, being able to go out into the field and know what I was doing. And so the reason why I tell you this is because if I would have never played t-ball as a little kid, eventually making it to my senior year of high school, I, I would have never made it if I would have never worked, my, the, worked through the ranks, worked and developed my skills, and got the training and, and constantly refining my techniques and fundamentals, I would have never been considered for the starting position on the varsity baseball team. If I would have never started back at the t-ball little kid. And when you look at those t-ballers, you're, like, you're thinking to yourself, man, they're never gonna make it. Those guys are a bunch of, like, th the rejects. I was one of those guys running around, running the wrong way. Funny hat, look, looking all funny. But if I would have never played t-ball and worked my way up through the ranks, I would have never found myself as a starter on the varsity baseball team. And so what I'm, what I'm getting to is that it was a series of little steps. Someone say little steps. It was a series of little steps over time, not overnight. It was a series of little steps. I'm repeating this because I want you to hear it. I want it to stick with you. It was a series of what? little steps overnight, over time that developed me, that prepared me, that got me ready for what I would one day have a heart and a desire to do. There's a man, his name is Zig Ziglar. He puts it this way. He says it really well. He says, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Let that soak in. You don't have to be great to start, but you have, to be, you have to start to be great. Some of us are frozen in time. We wanna do things with our children, but we make the excuse that I don't have time or I don't have the resources or I don't have the finances or I've gotta get things in order. By the time they're gonna be old enough, the time is already gonna be gone. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. You see, when I started out in t-ball, I had no idea what I was doing. But you've got to start somewhere. Look at your neighbor and say, you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start from the beginning. You don't start out as CEO. You start out many times scrubbing the toilets. And you work your way on up to the top. And many times you'll, you'll come to realize that the times that you learn the most is not in your success, but it's in your failures. And so when you fail, you don't stop. You pick up the moral of the story. You pick up the lesson. You pick it up. You dust your feet off and you keep going. You keep chugging along. You don't give up. You don't quit but you learn in your failures. Anybody ever heard of a, a man named Babe Ruth? Just by chance, you've heard of Babe Ruth? Who has not heard of Babe Ruth? Okay, good. He's a household name. One of the greatest and biggest names in baseball history. He's known for being the king of home runs. Do you know how many home runs he had? Just offhand, offhand. 61? Maybe in a season. He had career, he had 714 career home runs. 714 career home runs. But do you know how many strikeouts he had? 
1,330. You never hear about that. You never hear of the strikeouts. You always hear of he's being the home run champion. He's the home run king. I want to hit the ball like Babe Ruth. Oh, you want to strike out? Because more, it's more likely that you're going to strike. But you know, he didn't stop because he struck out. He kept going because he wanted to hit a home run. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. The thing that successful people and unsuccessful people have in common, you may think that, that these two groups of people have nothing in common, but I found something that they have in common. The, uh, the successful and the unsuccessful people have in common is that they all have goals, they all have dreams, they all have desires, they all have things that they want. But what sets those who are successful apart from the unsuccessful is not the passion, it's not the desire, and it's not the goals. It's the systems that they've set in place that will ensure that they reach their goal. If you're taking notes, you're gonna to wanna to write this down. Those who are successful have dedicated themselves to doing the small things that are leading in the direction of big things over time. They're not looking for the big home run all in one wallop. They're making sure that they're taking small steps they're, they're, they're focusing on the, on the small things, doing the small things that are leading in the direction of big things over time. It's not typically the big life-altering, earth-shaking singular move that we make that gets us to where we need to go or where we wanna be. For example, I've seen people who, who will move out of the city that they've lived in for years, sometimes even move out of the state, trying to get away from the issues that they have, it's trying to get away from the problems or the people thinking that in one big move that all their problems are gonna magically just disappear. But what I've discovered, side note, what I've discovered a while ago is that no matter where I go, guess who's there? I'm always there. <laughs> I always find myself everywhere I go. And the problems that I have, they like to follow me. And I'm, if I'm having issues many times, it's not because of something or someone else, it's because of something that I'm doing or it's something that I'm not doing. I can't push the blame on the city I live in, the state I live in, or the people who are around me that could be part of it. But we're looking at, at doing small things that are leading to the big things over time. So those people who moved out of, out of city, out of state, about, after about three to five years, many times, maybe sometimes sooner, all the issues that they thought they had, that they had run away from are all back. Sometimes they bring their friends with them and they have more, more issues, more problems. And if only they would have spent those three to five years not focused on one big move, but dedicated themselves to making small steps that were leading in the direction of big things they most likely would have made a lot more progress, whether it was financially, maybe they were in debt, maybe they were struggling with, with their spending habits. And instead of, instead of dealing with, with making small little moves so that it will lead to big things over time, they wanna make this big old move, run away from the issue, run away from the problem and find out that now they're more in debt. They just buckle down, sit down, figure out a plan, figure out a system of, of how I'm going to pay this off. Maybe they were dealing with relationships. Maybe it was maybe a divorce or maybe it was just a, a, um, maybe with, with a, a job and they're trying to get away from people and they move to the other, the, the other city or the other state. And by the time three to five years comes around, they're finding out that the same problems, the same issues they had have different faces. Small things, doing small things that are leading in the direction of big things, not overnight, but over time. Sometimes someone will, will run from an addiction. They think if they get out of this town, there's just so many things and people that, that are in this town that are just, that are uh, the reason why I, I am the way I am. But then they move to another town and they find those same people in a different town that lead them to the same addictions. Small things leading to big things in the direction of big things over time. Are you, are you catching on this morning? And so 
Paul is showing us in his letter to the Ephesians that this is the same way in our faith journey. If you go back with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter in that 17th verse, we see here, I'm reading out of the amplified version because it amplifies it. <laughs> and it, and it, it, it gives a, a bigger picture. Actually, it, it, it narrows it down what these words are meaning or what the thought behind these words are. And he starts off by saying in the 17th verse, so this I say, and solemnly affirm together with the Lord as in his presence. So he's saying that I've been given authority by God to, to share this with you. I've been, this is not my words. This is what God has given to me that you no longer, you must no longer. This is not like, oh, did he really mean that? No, he, you must long, no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live. What's a Gentile? A Gentile is any, anyone other than a Jew. And so I'm a Gentile. Unbelieving, and a lot of times before, before Jesus came, the Gentiles would be categorized with the heathen or the sinners. And so, so Paul, he's speaking to Gentiles who are now making up the church. He says, you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live, the way you used to live, in the futility or the emptiness of their minds and in the foolishness and emptiness of their souls. And so Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus, he's saying this word that I'm bringing to you has been approved by God. And he's given me the authority on the subject of, of how a Christian or a Jesus follower should be living. And in, in a way he's saying, do you remember the way that you used to do life? Do you remember the way you used to think? He's saying, well, that's gonna change. That's all gonna change. Because if you think that you can use the same systems that you've been using for all these years to try to get a different result, you're only fooling yourself. He goes on to say that you must no longer live in the unbelieving, in that 17th verse, you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility of their minds and in the foolishness and emptiness of their souls. He, he's saying, remember how you were, you were always trying to figure out how to be happy while at the same time rejecting God. Remember how all those things that you did, all those things that you tried, all those places that you went, remember how they all just left you feeling empty? Yeah, we're not doing it that way anymore. That's what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus. We're not, we're not going down that path anymore. We're not going down that road anymore. Sometimes you need to look in the rear view mirror so that you can see clearly of where you're going. So you can look back and so that you can see clearer of the direction that you are headed. So that you can remember where you came from so you don't go back there. You're not distracted by that darkness, the ugliness. He's saying we're changing our systems. We're changing our way of thinking. We get into the 18th verse. He says, for their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is clouded. They are alienated and self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. There's no share in the life of God because they have alienated, they've made themselves stranger. They have, notice here the words he used, self-banished. They haven't been banished by God. God hasn't rejected them, but they're self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the willful, someone say willful, the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is deep-seated within them. We wanna blame someone else. We wanna blame God. We wanna blame this, we wanna blame this. But Paul is saying it was a willful ignorance. It was a willful spiritual blindness that was deep seated on the inside because of the hardness and insensitivity of their heart. Paul is saying that they've cut themselves off from God. God who is not only the creator of the world, but he's also the light of the world. Psalm 119, 105, the psalmist, he writes, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. That was Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love that 
Because when I was living in darkness, I didn't know where my feet were going. I didn't know where, what, where my next foot was gonna land because I, I was directing my own paths. And a lot of times it would lead me off a cliff. And if I was follow, following someone else who was also blind, they would lead me off a cliff too, or I would lead someone else off a cliff. And what he's saying is that this world along with my, my way of thinking and my reasoning can be really dark and cloudy, messing with my vision, messing with my direction, messing with my purpose in life. Paul is saying that when you cut yourself off from God, your visibility changes because there's an absence of light. Your understanding, your way of thinking has been flipped upside down. Your reasoning has been clouded and your heart as a result has become cold and hard. So now when you hear the voice of God or now when you hear correction or you hear someone trying to help you, you look at it as an offense. I'm offended, but before everything was okay. But when, you're, when your heart becomes cold, it becomes hard. When someone says something that is, that is truthful or honest or honestly wanting to help, you look at it as they're trying to hurt you. Paul is making it very clear that this wasn't God's doing. He wasn't, God wasn't the one doing the separating. He says they are alienated. What's the other word he uses? Alienated or strangers, self-banished. And so he's saying that they're strangers and that they've separated themselves from the life of God because of their willful ignorance. You ever known someone like that? Maybe you used to live your life that way where you were willfully, you know what the right thing to do, but you were willfully just playing dumb, going the wrong direction, knowing you were headed in the wrong direction, just maybe being honorary. Maybe you were just, uh, just trying to separate yourself from authority. Got yourself in trouble. He's saying their willful re- it was because of their willful rejection of God. You see, God is doing everything that he can to connect with you so that you can connect with him. He's making every way possible for you. This is Paul speaking to the, to the church at Ephesus. He's made, every, he's made it so clear that he's given you every opportunity, every chance to connect with him. Have, have you ever had a, a stalker before? Anyone ever stalked you to where everywhere you would go, they just wouldn't leave you alone? I've had a couple and everywhere I would go, everything I would do, um, they would follow me and it was really annoying. They just wouldn't leave me alone. Anybody here by, by chance? You ever had a stalker? Yeah, you've had stalkers. Okay. Okay. That's not something you want. It's not something you desire. It's just someone that wouldn't leave you alone. Everywhere you go, they're always there. I, I believe that God is so madly in love with, with us. He's so madly in love with you. Almost like a stalker. Like honestly, he's not gonna leave you alone. No matter how far you go away from him, no matter how much you flail your arms at him and tell him to get away from you, he's not gonna leave you alone. He's like that stalker who is gonna follow you around trying to tell you the right path to go. And I'm thankful for that because I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for that. He's so madly in love with you, almost as if it's an obsession of his that you would jump into his arms. I just, I just think of a, of, a, of a parent who maybe a child ran away. They want nothing more than that child. I don't care if you're dirty. I don't care, I don't care what you look like, what you smell like. Come here and come back to your, to your parents' arm, your mom or your dad's arms. I've been praying for you, kid. And I love you. And I'm not gonna stop praying for you. I'm not gonna stop seeking you until you breathe your last breath or your, your heart beats its last beat. 
And God is gonna give you every opportunity possible to connect with him all the way up to your last breath or your last heartbeat. We get into that 19th verse. And they, the ungodly in their spiritual apathy or their coldness and indifference have become callous and unfeeling have given themselves over as prey to unbridled sensuality, eagerly craving the practice of every kind of impurity that their desires may demand. Have you ever burned yourself on an iron, on on a hot stove? Yeah, I have. So I've been told that, I've never done this, but I've been told that if you continue to burn yourself in the same spot over and over and over again, that eventually you'll end up destroying those nerve endings that were supposed to be alarming you of any danger that was hurting your body to where you lose all sensation and and feeling in that spot. And so if you burn it enough, enough times, eventually you won't be able to feel that part on your body. You will lose lose all sensation, hot, cold. You You can stab yourself and you won't even feel it. And that's the way it is when we go after every craving and every desire that our body is crying out for. We're searing our conscience, we're searing our mind, we're searing our spirit, separating ourselves. Not God separating himself, but we're separating ourselves and we're getting further and further away from God to where his voice is now in the distance. And the things that we used to be sensitive to don't even bother us anymore we start to get callous to the things that used to really irk you, the things that you really used to, to, oh man, I shouldn't be doing this. You do it enough times, you reject God enough times, eventually it's not God separating from you, but it's you searing your conscience. It's you becoming callous to the spirit of God. Where, where once you, 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 you really looked forward to hearing his voice, but now it's like, oh God, like stop it. And now his voice is in the distance, not because he's far away, because that feeling that you had, that, that, that sense, sensitivity that you used to have is no longer there. That 20, 20th verse, he says, but you didn't learn Christ in this way. I love this, he, he makes a, a flip here, he says, Now, this is the way you used to live. These are the systems you used to live in. These were the systems that were causing you to go in the direction that you had been going in and put you in the place that you are in now or that you had been previously. But you didn't learn that. You didn't learn Christ in this way. You see, Christ came to set you free, not to put you in bondage. In that 21st verse, he says, if in fact you have really heard him and have been taught by him, just as truth is in Jesus revealed in his life and personified in him, that regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self. Someone say, put off your old self. Completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires. He's saying, if you truly are a Jesus follower, then you believe that he is the light of the world, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, that no one can to come to the Father except through him, that there's only one door that leads to eternal life and that's through Jesus Christ. And because of him, we're able to get rid of the old man. We're able to get rid of that old woman, that old nature that used to control us and tell us what to do that only left us empty, alone, and in the dark. Paul is saying that when you, when you came to know Christ, you found the truth. The search has ended. And through Jesus, you're now able to kick that old man, that old nature, that old way of thinking to the curb because you are now a child of the Most High God. And you realize now that, that those old desires that you had, those old cravings that you had, they were all deceitful, they were all lies. They all, they all made promises that they couldn't keep. But now you're in the arms of a loving father. I 
I love what, how he uses deceitful desires. I just want to pause here for a second. We've all heard those same lies, depending on what, what your struggle is, what your demon is, whatever your thing is that you're struggling with, that you used to struggle with, or maybe that you're still dealing with hot and heavy right now. But the reason why you picked it up is because it lied to you. It told you that it would offer you some things that would make life easier. It told you some things It told you maybe your life would get better. Not maybe, your life is gonna get better if you, if you try me. If you pursue that person or that thing, it's a deceitful desire. It's a desire that is lying to you and once it's got its hooks in you, it's not gonna let go. And we get into that 23rd verse. We're winding it up here. He says, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind. Set up new systems, set up new habits, set up little things that will lead in the direction of big things so that over time, you will be successful. Be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. In Christ, every day is new. Every day we're continually being renewed in the spirit of our mind. There's not a day that goes by that a Jesus follower isn't renewed. Our, our relationship is made new with God every day. We're not perfect but we're making forward progress. We're no longer being corrupted through our deceitful desires, but we're being renewed through the Spirit of God. This is good. And in verse 24, the last verse that we're gonna read today, we'll pick it up next week. He says, and put on the new self. Someone say, put on the new self. Yeah, we need to say that. The regenerated and renewed nature created in God's image. This is what God created. This is what God created you for. He didn't create you so that you can go listen to deceitful desires and jack up your life, head in the wrong direction and hurt yourself and hurt others. But he created you for a specific purpose. And that purpose was to get, bring glory to him, to honor him, to love on and to be a blessing to the people around you no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. Not that we'd be taken advantage of them or taken advantage by them, but that we would love them regardless of what they've ever done or what they've ever said. This is what we've been created to do. This is Christ-like, created in God's image, God-like in the, in the righteousness or the right standing and the holiness or being set apart of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. This is what the Christian life looks like. We put on, first of all, we, we, we put off the old man or the old woman, and we put on the new man, the new woman, the new nature, the nature of Christ. And we live intentionally in the purpose that God created us for. If he created you in his likeness and in his image, the expectation would to be live to, to live in his likeness and in his image, right? You see, we were all created in the image and the likeness of God. And when we put on the new man, we begin to live, love, and look more and more like Jesus every day. And in the way that we live, the way we live out our life is an expression of our gratitude to God for his salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Before I conclude here, I've got to let you know, the only way that we can put off the old man or the old woman and put on the new is not by self-effort or by striving to imitate Christ. This is, this is important, church. I want you to know the work has already been done. The work has already been completed. The hard work, the hardest part of the whole thing has already been done in the death of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And when you come to believe in Jesus Christ, there's a renewal, there's a regeneration that takes place on the inside. We're no longer controlled by the old man. We're no longer controlled by the old way of life, but we're now controlled by the new way of life through God's spirit because Jesus Christ made it possible through his death and through his resurrection. And so we're no longer a slave to the old man or the old woman that we used to be. We're no longer a slave to who we used to be or to what we used to do. We're no longer a slave to fear, but we're now set free no longer in bondage to sin and the things of this world, but we've been made brand new through Jesus Christ. And now we are free. Now we are healed. Now we are whole. Would you put your hands together for Jesus today?